Okay, I'll, I'll continue. Yeah, it's so the Yes. So we're talking about the difference between emergency and disasters. Do you think that there is a difference between emergency and disasters? Emergency translate to while disaster is karita, right? The difference basically is in the uh, magnitude uh, of, of, of the happening. Emergency is something that is sudden, something that is urgent and needs an immediate action. While a disaster, it is something that is serious. Serious, but it also includes serious disruption. Serious disruption in human lives, serious disruption in material, in economic and environmental uh, aspects as well. So there is a difference between emergency and disaster. But why do emergencies happen? Why do disasters happen? Disaster happens mainly because there are hazards. في خطورة. The hazards um, are defined as dangerous things. Those hazards could either be natural hazards, you know, things that are beyond our control, like natural disasters, etc., or they could be man made hazards. So, hazards are dangerous phenomena or uh, things that would affect our lives and it would lead to different losses and damages. So as we said, we have uh, natural hazards like floods, fires, tsunamis, hurricanes, cyclones, earthquakes. These are all natural hazards. And um, can we predict natural hazards? Do you think we can predict them? I'll try to see from the chats if uh, anyone would have a yes. guess. Yes, we can predict them. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, with all the advancements in technology, mm -hmm. with the advancements in technology and advancements in monitoring system now, we have good warning systems that would tell us, oh, a strong wind would come on that day, a cyclone would happen there, a tornado would hit that area. So specifying the speed, the time, the geographical location. So we have good warning systems now. Um, Man-made hazards are maybe not that easy to predict, but we will have systems that would tell us, you know, if you do checkups regularly, you might reduce the risk of man-made hazards. What are the examples of man-made hazards? Fires, explosions, uh, toxic spills. I'm sure that you've heard about the toxic spill that's happening currently in the uh, uh, um, in Japan. Um, also, criminal situations like uh, by Terroristic attacks, for example, uh, hijacking, uh, hostage taking, active shooting, all of those are examples of hazards. Are these the only hazards that we have? No, we have a variety of hazards. Now, my question to you, are we encountering currently any type of hazards? Can you repeat the question, please? Are we encountering any types of hazards currently? Yes. Of course, yes, yes. yes. Even yes. these pollutions can be part of it. Of course. So yes. I mean, yes. Yes, so uh, Ahmed said yes, and we said the heat wave. Why? What is the reason that I'm um, not seeing you face to face, that we're actually conducting this online? I you open the camera? Of them already opened the, uh, their cameras, but oh. I'm not sure. Did you ask for the, it depends on the layout that you... Ah, okay, no problem. If anyone would answer, I wouldn't mind because I only have the... If you press uh, the button where it says maybe participants, maybe you can't see uh -huh. them. Yeah. Yes, it only shows the name. Okay. Yes. Um, so the hazard that we are currently facing, it is very good. It's the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. It is um, uh, a biological hazard and has disrupted all of our life. And it is a disaster and it is something that we would need to control. So this uh, workshop is very, very relevant to uh, what's happening uh, these uh, these days. Um, okay. I think if 
I would need to stop the participants. Um, now it doesn't want to flip. Okay. Okay, so when do we need to react whenever there is a hazard or a disaster? Do we react before the disaster or do we react after the disaster? Before. before. I think we work before, before the before disaster, disaster yeah. occurred. Before. Okay. Yeah. We, need to, we need to that? prevent before, to, before the care. Before it happens. For those who said before, you are 100% correct. Acting before the disaster happens is called preparedness. Preparedness. al jahiziya. And for those who said acting after the disaster happens, you are also correct because that is called the response. So when we have a disaster, you can either act before, during or after. It's all important. But which one do you think is the most cost effective? Which one would save us more money? Think of us as a government. Think of us as stakeholders. Which approach, which way? The before, very, very good. The before. Research has found that every one dollar you spend in preparedness, and we know now preparedness is the before. Very good. Every one dollar you spend on preparedness saves you four dollars uh, on the response. So if you want to be smart about the money, spend on the preparedness. Have more of a jahiziya rather than at the fa'ul or, you know, the thing that comes after that. Uh, disaster preparedness uh, leads to reducing the risks, reduce the hazards, because you would look at what are the problems and you would try to solve them. So it does help in, um, or it does play a role in ensuring that people have the necessary equipment, that they know where to go, they know what to do, they know how to keep themselves uh, safe once the disaster happens. So if we now define emergency and disaster preparedness, we know that it's the before. So let's just, you know, stick together a definition. It is the process of turning awareness of natural hazards and risk into actions. Actions to do what? Actions to reduce the risk, to respond to re disasters, okay? Okay, so some of you uh, might ask, all right, it makes sense that we uh, prepare for the disaster um, and we need to not only prepare for the disaster, we need to invest on things that prepare us for disasters. That means I'm going to spend money on preparing things. But what if the disaster didn't happen? Is it really necessary to do uh, preparedness? Do I really have to do it? Does, you know, do governments really need to prepare even that there is a possibility that it might not happen? The answer is yes, yes. Emergency preparedness is very, very important because it saves lives. It saves uh, uh, people from getting injured. It saves uh, uh, people from suffering from disasters. It also protects capitals it protect um, uh, you know the sources of money so it protect the equipments the buildings the properties and it does help people in resuming uh, uh, to their normal life as soon as possible countries that have good systems of um, disaster preparedness have better capability of going back to normal situations and when I'm talking about all of this, just think of the pictures that I've showed at the beginning of this uh, uh, session. Those two, um, the, the two, the two buildings. So you have Haiti that didn't have any system of preparedness, disaster preparedness. When the earthquake hit, everything collapsed. It took them years and years and years and years to rebuild. While look at Japan, earthquake after earthquake after earthquake, they are prepared. Even when they build things, the material that they use can withstand earthquakes. It's very important that we also discuss emergency and disaster preparedness because um, in the 
recent decades, we have things that made us more vulnerable, more susceptible, more at risk of having disasters, because we have now more infection, more emerging infectious disease, as you can see from the COVID, you know, we're more uh, susceptible to uh, pandemics. We also have higher population density. People, Earth has too many people, too, too many people. So one disaster can affect too many people. And we have the aging population. People who, you know, you know that people are living older, uh, living longer now, right? If you compare the past and the present, people do live longer now. So those aging population, they are very vulnerable. They become, you know, uh, like a weak point that you need to take care of. International travel. And I like to spend a few seconds in international travel because um, the COVID-19 has turned from an epidemic to a pandemic. I'm sure that you've heard those terms from a waba ila ja'iha or janiha. It has turned because of international travel, because it started on China and then ta 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 to the rest of the world. How did that happen? By international travel. So international travel does lead to an increased risk to disasters, especially biological disasters. <clears throat> so how do disasters happen? Disasters have life cycle just like any living thing. Uh, this slide was supposed to come without the disaster sign. So I want you to imagine or pretend that the disaster sign is not there. What is the life cycle of the disaster? Disaster consists of preparedness, response, recovery, mitigation. I know some words are sounding very heavy and, you know, what are we saying? But they're very, very simple. Preparedness is derived from the term prepared. Jahiziya. Response is how you act to something. Recovery, التعافي, how you get over something, how do you become better. Mitigation is how do you reduce something. تقليل. So for a disaster, before the disaster happened, we expect that there is preparedness. Preparedness in a form of what that we will have emergency response team, we will have trainings, we will have exercises. And the disaster will happen and then we're going to have response. Let's imagine that the disaster is an earthquake, God forbid. The response will be the teams that would come and try to save people from under the rebels, uh, that would clear the ways, that would, you know, uh, try to bring water to those who are being affected, etc. The recovery is how do we, you know, those who lost their homes, how do they rebuild it? Those who lost their restaurants and businesses and lost their cars, how do they recover economically, psychologically, housing, etc.? and mitigation, how do we make sure that next time the disaster happen, the risks are less? I'm, I'm reducing the risk. I'm trying to reduce the risk as much as we can. So usually the disaster happens between which life cycle or between, between which phases? It's between the preparedness and the response. So you're being prepared and then you expect a disaster to happen. And once the disaster happened, then you respond to it. OK, some might ask me, can some countries be in the preparedness forever? Yeah, if they didn't go through a disaster, then yes, good for them. That means they didn't have to go through the response, the recovery and the, the uh, mitigation. But as you have seen from the examples of disasters, there are many disasters. So I doubt that there is a country that didn't go through a disaster at all. OK, now my question to you. The fact that you are joining the Sohbati program and you are uh, becoming ambassadors for health and, you know, raising awareness in the population. Is it an example of preparedness, response, recovery or mitigation? Response. Mm -hmm. Mitigation. I think uh, it is uh, mitigation. Mitigation mitigation because you've read public education yeah yes yeah kind of i think <laughs> yes 
it is a part of mitigation, but it's also actually part of preparedness. And I'll tell you why. If I take you and I train you to respond to disasters, so part of the disasters, you know, in disasters, people can get very anxious and they don't know how to deal with things and they become very disorganized. And I have this group of youngsters, you know, amazing youth who understand disasters and understand that it's going to be difficult and they start to calm down the, their families and their friends and their community. So I've managed to get a group that is helping people, you know, in case something has happened, then they will be prepared. So it's also part of preparedness. Yeah. Um, I thought that I've threw a little bit of definitions here and there. Maybe it's good that we just go through them uh, quickly. So disaster response is um, is defined as decisions and actions taken to deal with immediate effects of an emergency. So it's the way we react to uh, uh, to an emergency or a disaster. Uh, some people have, some countries have very quick, very prompt, very urgent, very effective and efficient disaster response. So other countries take their time and they, you know, do the try and error. And it's all acceptable in disasters because nobody's used to disasters. Mitigation, as we said, it's lessening or limiting uh, the adverse impact of a hazard. Um, in, a, in a, when disasters happen. Public awareness, I'm sure that you've heard of this term. It's the extent of a common knowledge about disaster risk. It's very important that um, the public is aware of risks and hazards. And um, uh, my experience here in the UAE have reflected that the public is very, very aware and very informed in a sense of people are always following the updates from reliable sources and we'll see the importance of that. Okay, let's take, um, let's be fast readers and take 10 seconds or 15 seconds to read this piece. Okay, so it's talking about a cyclone. You know, it's a cyclone, right? It's like a tornado, Asifa Shadida, um, in Bangladesh. And obviously, from this piece, it tells you that Bangladesh is a country that is uh, 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 gets hit every now and then with cyclones. What are the difference in in the different incidences of these cyclones? Is each one of them happened in a different year? in addition to the number of people who have been killed in each cyclone. 1970, you have half a million people who died in the cyclone. I want you to pay attention to the speed of the cyclone. So it's 223 kilometers per hour. Another cyclone hit in uh, 1991. It hit 100 or it killed 138,000. So almost half or less than half of um, of, of uh, way less than half than, than those who have died in 1970. Although, what was the speed of the cyclone? Was it more or less? So they had, the speed was more. More. Uh, absolutely. It was, it was more. It was more, thank you. More. Absol absolutely thank you. more. Yeah. yeah. So they had a, a, a more severe cyclone, but they managed to reduce the number of those who have been killed. Now I want you to look at uh, three years from that. In, 19, for, in 1994, I'm sure that you have not been born at that time. 1994, um, a cyclone of 250 kilometer per hour. So that is way, way, way more destructive than the previous ones. And how many people have died? only 127. It's sad that we've lost 127 lives. I don't like to think of lives as numbers, but it's sad. Yet, um, it's quite impressive that they managed to reduce it from half a million to 127. In 1997, 
a 200 km per hour killed 111. How do they manage to reduce the number of, uh, of deaths this much? It's a significant reduction. It's all because now they had uh, the cyclone preparedness program. Whenever they're building, they're building buildings that can withstand cyclone. Whenever they, uh, um, you know, the, their forecast became more, um, more efficient, uh, fishermen now would hear the weather forecast before they go to the sea, people would uh, abide by the rules. Whenever there is a cyclone, people would go to bunkers, etc. So mm -hmm. their preparedness program has managed to reduce lives. And that's the best practice. That's the importance of cyclone or, or preparedness programs in general. Okay, so you might ask me, okay, Amal, uh, we understand that preparedness program are important, but what does that have to do with us? You know, let someone else do with the emergency preparedness program. Uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just a young person. I don't have much to help with. Is it really my business? Is it my responsibility uh, uh, to be involved in emergency preparedness? And I would tell you, yes. Why? Because it is the responsibility of everyone. It's everyone's responsibility to be part of emergency preparedness programs. Not special, not, not necessarily a program like you would volunteer or, or, but understanding how to act in disasters, understanding where to seek the information from, understanding not to be a source of problems, but rather a source of help. That's what we mean by contributing positively to emergency preparedness. So if we look now at the process of preparedness, how do, uh, how do they do emergency preparedness uh, process? You have, they put policies, they, they see who are vulnerable, uh, meaning who are the weak people who get affected the most by any disaster, how do they uh, prevent it, how do they plan it, etc., etc. And then you have this train and educate train and educate it is where me and you play uh, a role there i educate i train you receive the education you receive the training you apply it so it it's it's us the community we are part of the emergency preparedness uh, process we are part of it we do contribute to it so we do have a responsibility uh, community participation, um, it's exactly what we have just discussed. It's our part as uh, people who live in a community to be part of uh, emergency preparedness. How can we do that? By receiving public education, by receiving trainings, by doing rehearsals, uh, by being part of campaigns, by uh, maybe some would you know, volunteer with response teams. Uh, some, um, I'll give you a good example. How many of you, maybe when you were at school or you were at the university, uh, you had a fire drill? You know, it's a fire drill. You know, it's not a fire, but the fire alarm will go on and they would ask you to clear the building. No. Yeah. And many people would be like, ah, it's not a real fire. Yes, Why? Of course. Okay. <laughs> Why are they bothering us? It's not a real fire. We know it's not a real fire. And they're dragging their legs on corridors, not very, very encouraged to leave the building. And you could see that uh, they just don't want to be part of that. Just being part of a fire drill, just making the fire drill a success is a community participation. What is the importance of a fire drill? A fire drill is telling people what to, do, what to do in case a real fire happen, in, from, which, uh, from which exits to leave from, uh, where to assembly or where to gather, what to do. There are no elevators. They will have to use the stairs, how not to push each other. So all of these rehearsals, all of these trainings is part of um, uh, emergency preparedness. So community participation can come in a simple form as making drills a success. So as we said, disaster drills, they are an exercise. Many of us know it's not, it's not true. We are just exercising 
uh, to simulate the circumstances that would happen in case a disaster happens, to let people know how to uh, react, what the response should be in case a disaster happens. Is it important? Absolutely. Why? Because when we have any drill, not only fire drill, any drill, it would tell us what are the weak points in our plan. So if we are too slow, that means maybe we need to add another exit where people would exit. If people gathered in a certain stairway, staircase, that means we need to find uh, alternative routes, etc. So finding weak points in the plan and get people familiar, familiar with uh, what they need to do uh, in case a real disaster happens. So the response becomes to them as automatic. I can, I can show you now this picture with the little kids under the desk. Um, Japan is a country that get hit very commonly with earthquakes and not any earthquakes, very strong, very, very strong earthquakes. Part of the education that they give to children is how to react in case earthquake happen. Do you think they wait until the earthquake happen and then they would tell them, come get under the desk now? They prepare them, they train them, they rehearse with them, they, you know, create uh, scenarios in which it would mimic or would be similar to when a disaster happened. And, and, um, and then once the disaster happened, children know because it becomes automatic to them. Uh, Yusuf, of, I don't mind uh, sharing them. Maybe the uh, organizers can... Uh, um, they can maybe coordinate sure. that. Yes. So examples of disaster drills, as we said, earthquake uh, uh, drills in Japan and all of the fire drills that we will, we had, uh, you know, um, I studied here uh, at school. So at school here in the UAE, we used to had, uh, have the fire drills. Uh, we were taught where to go, what to do. Um, you know, we were, we had proper, 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 uh, uh, preparedness in case a uh, real fire happen. <clears throat> okay. So whenever we're doing disaster preparedness planning, we need to know what are the resources, how much money, people, time do we have? Okay, because the resources would differ from community to our community and from country to another. We need to know what are the roles and responsibilities of, uh, of the people, because not everyone is going to act as an ambulance driver. Not everyone is going to act as a paradam uh, paramedic. Not everyone is going to be a, a, a firefighter, right? So understanding your role and responsibility and what you can actually do is very important in, in preparedness. Preparedness is not about creating heroes. We're not here to create heroes. We're creating individuals that are capable of acting in a sane and uh, a reliable way when disasters happen. Also, um, part of looking at the disaster preparedness is doing policies and procedures and training, training people, training people to know how to respond, how to recover from disasters, how to, recon excuse me, how to reconstruct and a very important part in, in disaster preparedness is to learn from the lessons. Uh, there are many countries that have wide experience with different disasters. We need to learn from them. Even if we had local experience, we need to look at our past uh, uh, you know, experiences and learn from the good things, learn from the success, and also learn from the failures. Because the failures would tell you that this area was weak, this area was weak, and try to strengthen it. Um, one of the best authorities or the authority that takes care of uh, uh, emergency preparedness is the National Emergency Crisis Disaster Management Authority here in the UAE. Their website is very informative. It is uh, very easy to access for the public. They have very interesting uh, material. Um, they have different updates, as you can see. So they have update on the COVID-19. They have update on Al-Hassan, Wiqaya, etc. Do check it. It's quite interesting. 
Um, here I wanted to show you an example of what's happening in the UAE. So UAE has been one of the countries that uh, has been upfront uh, uh, when it comes to emergency preparedness, especially with the current uh, pandemic. So um, I looked at this uh, flow uh, chart and I was just amazed because you could see that they've looked at different aspects of things and they've seen how to work around it. Um, so part of the preparedness uh, and increasing readiness for the pandemic, even before the pandemic was that spread, or once it has been announced from an epidemic to a pandemic, uh, you if you remember, we've heard remote working, you know, uh, hospitals, uh, they introduced the telemedicine that you can actually call your doctor and they would give you a prescription and things over the phone. Um, they were monitoring if employees health, so the regular checkups, etc. There were the checkups on uh, between the Emirates, uh, there was a Hessen app, so they were they did so many aspects of not only preparedness, but also response. And altogether, it did manage to curb down the numbers uh, in a very busy country. Um, as we said, the community participation can come in a form of volunteering. And we've seen that uh, by developing the youth and uh, the entire community leadership capacity. Uh, I don't know if some of you have um, have volunteered, uh, at least here in Abu Dhabi, I see, I, I live in Abu Dhabi, I see that a lot that many of the young people do volunteer in the screening tents or in the vaccination tents or in, you know, uh, they have uh, uh, different arenas in which they can volunteer and be part of the response team of this emergency. Uh, can you volunteer without training? Can you volunteer without training? The answer is no. It could, it could be. Uh, it could be. I but, think uh, uh, after training is better. Yeah, I also agree. I think after uh, training, uh, I can volunteer, so I can serve. Absolutely. You can't just decide to open a tent and you take some vaccination and start injecting people. Obviously, no one can do that. That would be illegal. But yeah. um, it's very important to know that. To be an effective uh, preparedness uh, response team, you need to receive the proper training for that. You need to receive it because, um, as I said, you don't want to be a source of a problem. You want to be a source of the solution. And the solution is by t you need to receive that training to tell you, okay, these are the things that you need to do. This is how you do it. So always think of volunteering as an aspect that would need either a briefing or a training, something that would tell you how things need to be done. Okay. Yes. Even if it was easy, so uh, Saad, you're saying it depends on how hard it is. Even if it's, if it's easy, they still need to brief you. Saad, this is how we do it. Yeah. Okay. God forbid, let's imagine that we have a disaster. Us, the community, what are we expected to do? We haven't got the time to receive training or, 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 or. There are things that we can actually do. We need responsibility from the community. Responsibility from the community. We need participation from the community, Part positive participation. You know, people offering their help. Maybe they would say, okay, we don't need any volunteers now. Or they would say, yes, we really need volunteers. So people extending the hand, that is the, 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 the role of the community. And it's, you know, even when you look at the United Nations and different NGOs, they say that the role of the community participation is very important because when disaster happens, it's usually the first one who get to the scene of the disaster, it's the community. Let's imagine that there is a big fire. It's usually the people around the fire who would try to put off the fire and call the firefighters, right? So it's the community. So we expect from the community responsibility, participation, and resilience. Resilience. Are you resilient? Yes. Very good. Of course. Awesome.
I'm, I'm very happy to hear people can, you know, confidently say that they are resilient. Uh, does the community need to be resilient? Yes, let's think that resilience is something very important for the community. Uh, is resilience needed more during disasters? Yes. Okay. Before we think of an example, maybe we need to see at what is resilience. Maybe some of you are not familiar with that term. Um, resilience translates in Arabic to al-muruna. Al-muruna is the ability to bounce back from adverse, uh, uh, from bad things. It's the ability to bounce back, ability to recover from misfortune or change or any adverse uh, action. Community resilience is something that is very, 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 very important. It is the ability of the community to withstand and recover from adversity, from any disaster that happened to them. So there are communities that their ability that once something, some disaster happened, the next day you will find them on the scene trying to help in clearing the disaster and returning everything back to normal as soon as possible. That's the resilience. That's the resilience. Uh, can you think of a population that has high resilience? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the question again? Can you think of a population that has high resilience? They are known, you know, in the in in uh, as they say in the literature, they're known to have high resilience. Uh, America. Uh, it's actually the <laughs> Japanese again. <laughs> Why? Um, it's part of their culture, and as I said, because. Countries that get hit commonly with natural disasters are known to have higher resilience. And the Japanese, the resilience started from the World War II. After World War II, you know, with the nuclear bomb, they have cities that have been pancaked to earth, and they rebuild their country again. And they rebuild, and then an earthquake comes and destroys everything, and then they rebuild again and destroys everything, and they rebuild again. So they have resilience. They have the ability to bounce back. In the UAE here, we have community resilience in a form of people are willing to adjust and adapt to change. So when they say the regulations has changed from this to this, people do it. So that is resilience as well. Community resilience is something that is very, very important during disasters. So we need to capitalize on that. How can we achieve community resilience or what are the forms of community resilience? Uh, community resilience can come in a form of the ability to organize uh, themselves. When the people have the ability to, they had a problem, they get themselves together and they know how to act. When they're empowered, when they're confident, when they have local knowledge and resources about the disaster, when uh, they can understand the risk and they are willing to cope with the uncertainty. That is uh, resilience. So um, uh, communities that don't have resilience take a longer time to recover from disasters. So resilience is something that is needed for communities and also as individuals, it's uh, needed. The, um, the resilience, the participation, the, uh, the uh, responsibility, um, as we said, they are things that the community can contribute positively with in case of disasters. Um, the community responsibility can come in a form of us, the community, to be credible and reliable. And I think this is quite important whenever we talk about disasters, rumors starts, right? You're all in social media, right? Yes. Yes. I don't think anyone yes, of nowadays course. <laughs> Of course we are on social media. Yes. And I'm sure that you've heard all type of stories since this pandemic started. Conspiracy yes, theories. Precisely, yes. yes. So um, 
these theories, those rumors must have a source. Don't be the source of the rumors. When disasters happen, be very careful in every word that you voice out because you as a sender, you don't know what is the filtering process that the receiver have because we have people who believe everything. And we see it now with the vaccination that there are many people who are anti-vax and they think this and they think that. And, and it's just, it's, um, it's terrible to have uh, this during a disaster. So be credible and be reliable. Promote action in a sense of, we have a disaster, disaster happened. We can't do anything about, you know, uh, uh, rewinding from the disaster. This is the situation we are in. Let's act on it. Let's stop saying, bring back the days before the coronavirus. No, we can't bring back the days before the coronavirus. Corona is a reality. You know, we have little children, those who are three years and four years. Imagine a four-year-old. Half of his life or her life is a pandemic. That's a reality, isn't it? So let's promote action that a disaster happened. We're going to be resilient. We're going to bounce back. Calm the anxiety. Calm the anxiety. Numbers are going to go up. Numbers are going to go down. Things are going to change. Yeah, but we're going to not be anxious. We're not going to, even when you see people around you who are anxious, you're trying to calm them down. Show respect to those who are being affected by the disaster. Yeah, um, for the credibility and the reliability, some might say, I really want to participate in spreading the knowledge about the disaster, but I don't know where to get the information from. Try to find uh, reliable sources of information. WhatsApp, Twitter, uh, you know, social media is not a reliable source because everyone can post on social media. If you really want reliable sources, you can go to, you know, like the, the website that I've showed you here, the National Emergency, the National Emergency Crisis and uh, Disaster uh, Authority. That's a reliable source. You can go to the WHO, that's a reliable source, but a text message or a WhatsApp message that you have received from your friend cannot be validated. That's not a reliable source. Okay. Uh, we had to mention the social media. <laughs> um, social media during disasters, unlike other disasters, you know, this is not the first pandemic that humanity has gone through. We had other pandemics, but what makes this pandemic different is a pandemic that happened during the social media times. Um, all of us have seen the videos at the start of the pandemic, people who get COVID-19 and people had the gear and it was just too scary. We had the uncertainty, we were scared, we didn't know what is this virus is all about. And then we started hearing about it being a man-made and uh, someone has eaten something and all of those things that not necessarily being validated. So let's use social media. We know that social media could be a source of information or misinformation, unfortunately. Social media has the power of you being able to be the sender of the news and the receiver of the news. It's not like newspapers and the TV and the, you know, the traditional media uh, channels. Traditional media channels, we're just receivers. We receive the news. While in social media, we could be the one who create the content and create the news. Since we are that, we have to be very credible and we have to be very reliable and we have to be source of truth rather than a source of disruption, okay? So with the social media, during disasters, whether this disaster or any future disaster, God forbid, always use it wisely, use it wisely. So the things that I hope that you have learned from disaster preparedness and response is that always need to be prepared because emergencies can happen, they're sudden. 
Disaster can happen. Some of them are out of our hand. Create a culture of preparedness and prevention. It's very important that we introduce the concept of let's be prepared in case something bad happened. It's not. It's not a bad. يعني أنا فاهم إنه في ناس بيقول لك يعني ما تتشاءم وكذا. It's it's not تشاءم, but it's just being prepared. It's not being pessimistic. You're just trying to be prepared. Be responsible. Be responsible. Seek the information and updates from reliable sources. If you're not sure about the source, don't share it. Don't share it. Be an asset. Be a gain. Be, uh, you know, they say always, uh, be an asset, not a liability. But I don't like to write the not a liability. I don't think any person is a liability. I think that everyone is capable of being an asset if they use their resources. Okay. Now it's the time to test your knowledge. A, B, C, or D. So I can't see the question. I can't see it. Okay. One of the following includes action taken to return to normal once an emergency occurs. Is it mitigation? Is it response? Is it preparedness? Is it recovery? Can I answer? Sure. Uh, D, recovery. Recovery. Very good. Very good. It's the action that when you want things to go back to normal, it's the recovery. When you're trying to fix things related to the disaster, that's the response. Very good. Can read that too. Using safety standards in selecting buildings materials uh, to protect from collapses during earthquake is an example of mitigation, response, preparedness, or recovery. I think preparedness. Very good. It's preparedness. Well done. All right. That is it for uh, emergency preparedness. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if you have any questions. Um, if you would like to share them with us. And if you have um, questions, that's also my email. Uh can you just stop sharing because uh, Sharja Media wants to take a screenshot with your face and the students together? Oh, sure, no problem. Okay. So, who, who who is ready to open their cameras? Uh, I would be thankful if everyone can share their or open their camera cameras, so Sharja Media can take a a group photo of you. <laughs> sharing. Yes. Maybe I will take the host from you, maybe, and. It will go out from. Do you want to save the document? Yes. Okay. Just. All right. Okay. Yeah. So you can continue your uh, Q and A's with the students while Charger Media is uh, taking a record of the meeting. Okay. You are welcome, Aisha. Do you have any questions? I do encourage you to seek uh, volunteering opportunities. It's um, um, a mind broadening you know, experience, especially I know that many of you are either starting to think about college or have already started college. And this is a time when you're active and uh, physically active and uh, mentally active, and you do contribute a lot with your creativity uh, to any place that you work in. So think about volunteering and things that are related to disasters. In, it would be very helpful for your community. I would just uh, like to do, say that we have a evaluation form uh, posted in the chat. If you can just participate and answer the few questions on your opinion of today's session. And then we can have a brief about uh, the program for all of you once uh, Dr. Amal is uh, done with her presentation. 
Thank you everyone for listening and for the opportunity and I wish you good luck. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shamsa. Thank you everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Aman. Bye bye. Goodbye. Maybe you you need to uh, remove me from being a host. <laughs> you take over hosting. Thank you, Dr. Amal. You're welcome. Sure. Doctor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, once you are uh, maybe when you are, I can. Uh, if I exit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.